Uh, hey everyone, uh, this is Kamen, uh, and this is going to be the tutorial on uh, neural ordinary differential equations. So let me share my screen quickly. Can you see the notebook? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Cool. All right. So we're going to start by firstly defining what uh, ODEs are in their simplest form. So ODE stands for ordinary differential equation. And the idea of ordinary differential equations is uh, we're trying to uh, describe a system uh, through um, sort of the behavior of how it changes, uh, and in particular to what is called as, as, as the ordinary differential equation, as, as you can imagine, such as the thing that's uh, outlined here. So the, motive, uh, the motivating example is we release uh, n rabbits onto an island, and they have no predators on there. And after a month, we notice that uh, they make k more. And after another month, we notice that they like uh, make l more rabbits, and we find that the ratio of the rabbits uh, between like month one and month zero is the same as the ratio between uh, the number of new rabbits between uh, month one and month zero. That is uh, another way to say this: is we notice that the number of new rabbits that get born is uh, proportional to the number of rabbits um, uh, that is present uh, at, island, uh, at that moment. So this is probably the simplest um, example of a neural ordinary uh, dif differential equation. And we can actually find uh, the, oops, the functions n of t here that um, satisfy this. So uh, with the setup that I just said, where we measure each month, this was actually a discrete sequence of measurements. But if we imagine that we measure infinitesimally, uh, infinitesimally often, um, infinitely often rather, uh, we can turn this into a differential equation where like we're interested in, in in the change in the population of rabbits uh, with respect to t, which is a continuous variable. So uh, as I said, we can find the exact solution to this equation. But in uh, physics, for example, we often uh, come uh, across things that we can describe with differential equations, such as the equation here, that is much, much tougher to, uh, that, are, uh, that are much, much tougher to um, solve. So it's known that most differential equations in general are difficult or sometimes impossible to solve closed form. Now, this can be a bit discouraging, uh, but realizing that we can sort of approximate how um, the function changes through like subsequent uh, to consecutive steps uh, approximating the, the gradient at that point allows us to sort of like do some pretty cool stuff with the with the functions that we have um, access to. So the simplest way we can do this approximation, we can solve this uh, ODE, is by observing that uh, we can do a, a first order Taylor approximation of the function uh, at at the point uh, t plus delta t, and uh, this function here. Let me just select it. Yeah, so uh, this function here um, is exactly the derivative of nt with respect to t from the equation here. So I've just rearranged and solved for that. Um, all right, so are there any conceptual questions of what an OD is? Uh, doesn't seem to be the case, so I'll just move on. Um, all right, so this is quite cool, but sometimes we can't even describe the uh, OD uh, in, in terms of like simple functions. Um, so this is where we come up with the idea of describing the OD, the, derivative, the derivatives in the OD with a neural network. So this is quite an interesting idea actually. So this is sort of saying that if we imagine the input of a network to be a state at time t0 and the output of the network 
um, sorry, I should say the input of a function is uh, is a state at time uh, t zero, and the output of a function is the state of uh, at time t one. We can describe the derivative of that function with respect to time with a neural network. So um, how uh, how exactly can we do that? Well, uh, firstly, we, we need to think about how can we, given, given a network that's already trained, how can we uh, proceed in evaluating what the prediction of this function is going to be? Uh, and that's going to be exactly um, following this formula. So we have our input, at, uh, which is this, this function z at time zero. And we know the, how that changes with time. So our output at time t will be exactly uh, just the integral from uh, zero to this uh, wanted time t uh, of, of our function of the neural network. Now, integrating this is in, in, in closed form is almost always going to be impossible. So we we'll always have to revert to uh, an ODE solver such as this one. So we will uh, we'll be doing uh, these approximations repeatedly. Um, and I can show you in code what that looks like. So given our action, uh, our uh, function f, we will repeatedly be doing this. We will start from our input, and then for a uh, small, uh, for some small steps size h, we'll be evaluating the derivative of this fu function and uh, just repeating this process however many, however many times uh, it takes us to get to uh, time one, which is the time at which we're saying that this function out uh, provides the output. So is this setup conceptually clear? If uh, there are no questions, I will assume that's the case and move on, but definitely feel free to uh, ask questions. This is quite a like, theory heavy tutorial. So if uh, you get stuck on something, like let me know. Cool. All right. So uh, now we know how to um, use our learned network to make a prediction. Now, the other, like the side of the other side of the coin, is how do we learn the weights of our network? Right. That's the sort of more difficult problem to answer here. Uh, now we have to keep in mind that the parameters of our network have a um, sort of like part to play at each of the infin infinitely uh, many times t between 0 and 1, or 0 and t. Um, so it seems like a quite a difficult um, task to say exactly how these parameters are going to affect, like how changing these uh, parameters is going to affect our loss, which is a function of this uh, function z at time 1 and the actual label. Um, but if we draw an analogy to um, usual, like regular neural networks, we can think of um, this uh, like evolution in time, a sort of an infinite number of hidden layers. So if a usual um, neural network um, has like 10 hidden layers, we can sort of imagine that the first hidden layer is positioned at time 0 0.1, the second at time 0 0.2, and the last one, the output layer, is, is positioned at time 1. So this is the same idea here, but uh, rather than having 10 layers, we're going to have like infinitely many layers, each making an infinitesimally small change from the previous one. So with that in mind, we uh, like going through the maps, which uh, I describe in, in the text here and uh, is sort of like further developed in, in this post here, we find update equations for uh, our parameters that are quite similar to what we see in backpropagation in standard neural networks. So uh, in, in particular, um, if we define the adjoint state AZ at time t, which is sort of like the error signal that you have in your usual um, neural networks, uh, we find that um, this should be, yeah, so uh, we find that uh, 
the error signal sort of like uh, changes. So, okay, uh, I should I should uh, motivate this. So we care about this error signal backwards in time, right? Usually what we would do uh, in backpropagation is repeatedly at each layer starting from the end and going backwards, propagate that error signals into the previous layer and at each um, iteration update the parameters, uh, sorry, at, at each layer, update the uh, parameters at that layer. Um, like uh, taking into account the error signal that's that's reached this layer, right? So something very uh, similar happens here. So the joint state sort of uh, represents this error signal, right? So we we define another OD, another ordinary uh, differential equation here, that is this propagation of the signal of the signal backwards in time. So this will start at time t or or time one. I've used this interchangeably, for which I apologize. Um, it, they both mean to be like the end time. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of run this OD backwards again using, you know, something like this, maybe using Euler's, uh, Euler's method, uh, method uh, until we reach like some time of interest that uh, we're currently looking at. Uh, and the way to do this is to define how that error signal changes with time. Uh, so doing the maps, we find that that error uh, signal changes in time in this way. Um, and from here, we can actually use this to find how our um, weight uh, change in time. So uh, this, this here defines sort of how our function changes in time. And then we care about how the, the weights of our uh, neural network representing the derivative change uh, as the loss changes, right? So if we imagine this to be the error signal, uh, we find that this equation is the uh, is uh, shows us how the error signal uh, propagates back in time, and this equation uh, tells us how the weights depend on the error signal at each time. Um, so this is quite a sort of nice analogy to the discrete case. Uh, sort of really motivates this interpretation of this ODE as a infinite depth neural network. Um, so I think this is probably where it's going to be most useful to ask questions. So if anybody is sort of struggling to get the concept, please go ahead and ask. Oh, uh, I'm going to look at the chat now. Uh, could you please provide some intuition on how the error signal OD relates to the original one? So the error signal OD is um, so the fact that it is an OD comes from the fact that we are working with continuous time. So right, so the fact that it is an OD is baked into the problem formulation, right? And then how the error signal relates to the forward propagation of uh, things is in a way quite similar to how the, you know, the backwards pass of a normal neural network relates to the forward pass in your network, right? So like, they're not, they're not the same thing, but there's definitely some uh, connection between them. Does that make sense? So uh, in, in particular, I think it's quite important to uh, realize that this is an ODE, like we care about uh, AZ of T, just because we've set ourselves up with a with a uh, time continuum, right? Uh, so anything that we ha like are interested in terms of T will have to be solved with an ODE. Cool. So uh, are there any other questions? I think it got much clearer. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so, uh, do in, do interrupt me if. Uh... So, uh, is this represented as a computational graph? Uh, yes, and we'll see how I I in in a bit. So, one final point on the theory of this: um, we will need to keep track of not only how the state uh, changes 
uh, not only how the parameters changes, but also we need to keep track of how time changes itself. Because um, this is sort of like the the element of we'll be working with sparse time uh, in here, right? Like, um, for example, we'll be looking at uh, sequence models later. And usually with RNNs, for example, we assume that our inputs come in at regular intervals, right? This allows us to have an input at time 0 0.1 and then an input at time 0 0.7 and then something at one, right? So irregularly spaced things. So we also need to capture sort of uh, that notion of uh, irregularity uh, with uh, with this um, with quantifying quantifying how things change as time changes. Oh, sorry. That, that's a bit confusing. Um, what the effect of the time changes on the system is a better way to put it. Cool. So um, let's look at an implementation and I will hopefully answer the question of like, is this represented in the computational graph? Um, so uh, first some boilerplate, some imports, it does not matter. We will have a simple uh, Euler like method OD solver. This is again just um, taking our initial value, uh, uh, evaluating the gradient there and taking a step in the direction of the gradient. The smaller h is, the better the approximation is, but the more steps we need to do. So this is uh, something quite uh, often encountered in ODE solvers is um, there is no one true approximation for these things. You all, like uh, you almost never get the actual answer. You'll be trading off approximating more uh, exactly versus like how many uh, steps you're performing here. Um, cool, all right, so let's look at the actual implementation of things. So there's one more trick to talk about uh, before we can understand the implementation is uh, we talked about how we we'll need to care about these adjoints or like these error signals with respect to uh, our state z, our parameters t, uh, theta, and our time t. Right? So we would usually uh, solve each OD for uh, d separately, but what actually happens, uh, like uh, it's it, it's quite nice the fact that we can actually combine these three things into one long vector. Each of these things will be a vector. So um, we can combine them in one long vector and run the OD on that long vector and find the solutions for each of these things um, separately. So this is just a, I guess you can just think about it uh, as a computational trick that saves time rather than something deeper. Um, and this, this will, like, we'll be using this concatenation trick throughout uh, the rest. Of, of the code, cool. So with the concatenation, the concatenation trick in mind now, um, first we define like the OD function and um, there's gonna be a lot of like reshaping and like uh, concatenating, expanding and things like that. I'm gonna ignore that. You should just assume that, you know, to sort of make it nicer for uh, PyTorch to, to work with these things. So the things of interest are, uh, this line here, well, okay, uh, first this line here, the self.forward uh, method in an NM module is just like running uh, the module forward. Um, so this is the forward part of forward we got. And then we are going to be caring about these quantities here that describe the change. And the way we, uh, we calculate those quantities is by, um, doing this uh, augmented joint state uh, computation. So um, let me see. So Grad finds the, hmm. Okay, uh, I'll skip talking about the details of how exactly this is done. Uh, like if you if you want more details, I've linked this here. Uh, it's it's on here, it goes into uh, further details, but like that line basically um, uh, 
executes this computation, which provides us exactly with, with the things that we care about. So uh, AT in here is the AZT in here. So these, these are things that we care about, and we can all do them in uh, a single computation uh, using, uh, using the augmented adjoint state. Cool. So everything else, as I said, is reshaping, uh, not very interesting. So then we move on to uh, defining uh, the autograph function. So this will get slightly more complicated. We add, an, we add another layer of, of complexity in that one of the applications that we'll be looking at, as I mentioned previously, is sequence modeling. And in sequence modeling, we'll be getting uh, functions at different times, right? So, uh, so uh, rather values at different times. Uh, we won't only get like an, one input and we want to produce an output, but we'll get an input, a second input, a third input, and maybe we, we, we want to extrapolate this onto like some uh, further times that we haven't observed yet. So we will um, we'll basically be doing the thing I described of like doing this sol uh, solution over and over again, uh, going through uh, these different time steps. So we'll be doing a um, forward pass from time zero to time one, and then like from time one to time two to and so on to time n, and they will be uh, doing a backward uh, backwards pass between each of uh, these methods. So you can just imagine it as a, as a for loop. Well, it, it is exactly a for loop going over these times, and it, each time for the forward method, uh, it's just running the OD forward in time. Uh, and then for the backward method, uh, this looks quite scary, but again, is it is a lot of like just saving things and reshaping. The only thing that we care about is this thing here. For the backward method, we'll just call our function to calculate the, uh, the gradients. And then we'll use those gradients to calculate how uh, we need to uh, change uh, our parameters between those two times. So this is the iteration over uh, the times going backwards and at each inter each iteration we'll be uh, computing um, let's see we'll be computing uh, sort of these backwards dynamics that come from this function of aug augmented dynamics as uh, dynamics as I mentioned before uh, this is going backwards in time um producing you know the solutions at uh starting from time uh it uh arriving at time it minus one getting these solutions we can find the gradients of our parameters and uh, everything is fine so uh, basically this is a quite a large chunk of code but what is doing is like doing those doing this this thing over and over again for each sequence of uh, time indices. So with that out of the way, if we ha have uh, time at the end, we can uh, come back to this and uh, look uh, at it again. Uh, defining the, uh, we've basically defined everything already. Like uh, we're just gonna wrap it in a neural network module just so we can um, deal with it easier. Um, so everything is basically comp contained in the OD adjoint method. Cool. So are there any questions, um, sort of like conceptually? I know the details are 100% going to be fuzzy because it's a lot of code to take in. But conceptually, is, is there something confusing? Uh, doesn't seem to be the case. Cool. So um, let's look at some cool examples then. So uh, we want to first uh, define a problem that that uh, is of interest, like that, that has dynamics that we uh, are of interest to us. So let's let's start with something simple. Let's start with uh, a two-dimensional state that updates in time according to this equation here. So 
if you sort of like play around with these uh, equations, graph the sort of vector field from the derivative, you find that this produces spirals like this one. So we start from the point over here, and then uh, the vector field uh, keeps pushing us towards the center. Uh, can you see by my mouse, by the way? Yes. Okay. Uh, keeps uh, going towards the uh, the center and eventually should uh, reach zero. Cool. So we've generated some data using uh, using this um, these dynamics, and we want to fit a neural OD uh, onto this data. Cool. So let's see how we can do that. So. Firstly, we're going to only be looking at uh, linear uh, ODs, and uh, this is represented by our neural network being a, a just a linear function. Um, and then this has the true dynamics baked in, so it generates the actual points. So this is how we can sample these points. And then we have uh, OD with some random parameters. Right. So we want to fit the parameters of the ODE, which is equivalent to fitting the dynamics uh, in this case. Right. So let's let's look at how that proceeds. If I didn't mess up something. Probably not gonna want to show. Okay, so good thing I prepared for this. So I'm going to. Have you actually run the yeah, previous yeah. So cells? Yeah. I have them saved as well, so I can show you, even though ah, okay. it's it's not showing. So I'm going to just reshare. Uh, screen one. So let's look at this, All right? Uh, can you see it's just some random lines squiggle? Can mm -hmm. you see me changing these? Yep. All right. So we're going to start with some completely random dynamics. And obviously, those dynamics are likely going to diverge. So we start somewhere over here. And as we follow the dynamics, we go to a random place. But as we iterate, things get better and better and better and better. We start to curve, we notice that the data curves. And the jump here, I guess, it sort of like hit some critical point and, and uh, became converging like into the origin rather than diverging into infinity. Um, and then as we go through the iteration, our dynamics fit the data better and better and better. And I stopped running it here. But if you continue running it, just because the problem is so simple in terms of the dynamics, um, you should uh, converge to, to the perfect solution, basically. You should uh, capture the data uh, perfectly. Um, now, compare that to trying to fit this data just like in, 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 in terms of like the, the data, right, rather than the dynamics. That, that's so, so much more complicated, right? Like, so fitting the dynamics allows us to take advantage of problems where the dynamics are fairly simple. Um, and I think I think that's that's really cool. Uh, so something else to note here is that you could have tried to do a recurrent ne neural network, right? You can sort of imagine feeding in uh, a data point at a time, right? And hoping that you end up capturing the dynamics here, right? That wouldn't work as well because of the uh, sort of disparate like times at, at which this function was measured, right? So the distance between these two points is quite a bit larger than the distance between uh, these two points. And neural ODs allow us to um, fit the data even, even when that's the case. Cool. Any questions so far? Um, I have one quick question. Yeah. Um, we say recurrent neural networks um, we cannot do like parallelism because of the the it's 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 um 
recurrent neural network and it has a time sequence so that mm -hmm. we cannot um, have a parallel calculation of each cell. So is it also the same in these um, neural OD because it has a time nature? Yeah, so uh, I'd say even more so the case. Um, you can't really parallelize this in terms of the time components. So because your neural network defines the dynamics of the of the system, you can't really focus in on a region and sort of see how it uh, updates over here uh, and make an update without affecting how it updates over here. So this is like it's baked into the model is going to have a sequential nature. All right. Thank you very much. Cool. All right. Um, let me reshare the notebook again. Okay, cool. So, um, all right. So uh, that's a really simple uh, in terms of like the dynamics uh, model. So what happens for a more complicated model, like something that uh, looks like this, right? So I'll try to run this as again, but maybe you'll give me the same. Yeah, it's probably gonna give me the same issue. So I shouldn't have stopped the thing because I'm just gonna do the same. Uh, the fault? Okay. So let's let's look at the the fit here. So this time we even start in in, in quite a nice space. And I should have said uh, because the dynamics are more complicated, we try to fit this with a more complicated neural network for for the dynamics as well, right? So we don't are not really fitting this with linear dynamics anymore because it's very obviously non-linear in the dynamics. Like there's uh, you know quite a lot of changes in the in the vector field that you can't really express with linear dynamics. So the fit um, takes some time to sort of like capture the approximate dynamics. Um, and then it sort of settles into something that approximates the dynamics fairly well, but it oscillates around this again and again. Um, and for me, it's re really unclear whether this will converge into something at the end or whether it will just uh, you know uh, keep oscillating. Um, so there's this this sort of uh, I guess because this is a fairly new matter, it's still unclear in at least intuitively which functions uh, will be easier to fit and which functions will be harder to fit. For example, as we'll see later, there are very, very simple functions that we are unable to fit with the vanilla uh, uh, neural ordinary differential equations, and we have to uh, augment them to allow them to capture. So uh, because of like my inexperience in this, I'm, I'm unsure whether this is one of those functions who so we will never be able to sort of really fit the, the data properly, or whether this is just random oscillations until we converge into uh, the, the true function. But even like these intermediate things sort of capture the overall shape quite well, even if at particular points, there's quite a bit of difference between uh, our model's prediction and the actual data. Cool. All right. So that wraps up um, the sequence modeling part. Is the, are there any questions about the sequence modeling part? Um, I think this is um, really, really awesome. Um, I, I think so. Those, as well, yeah. Yeah. And those spirals um, reminds me of the manifold view of the data set. So. Um, like, yeah, that's that's interesting. You you could try to describe manifolds in terms of mm -hmm. some dynamics in a larger space. I hadn't thought of that. That's really cool. Right. So maybe, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm totally um, new to this area. Uh, so this notebook is like my first experience in neural ODA. But I guess um, guessing from your figures generated, I guess um, curve fitting in the in the manifold data set is a really, really good fit of this application. 
I guess. That could be the case. So uh, speaking of this, uh, I'm actually going to jump down to here to sort of talk about the limitations of the uh, vanilla OD. So imagine mm -hmm. I have like some function that maps uh, the point one into the point minus one and the point uh, minus one into the point one, right? So we know that we should be able to find functions such as uh, these ones that sort of like continuously navigate the space and end up in those positions. Now, if we restrict ourselves to um, first order uh, uh, ordering differential equations, the order uh, of the equation is like how many derivatives we, we've taken at most in, in our equation. We've so far only talked about uh, first order derivatives. Uh, if you focus on the point here, the crossover point between the two functions, we'll notice that on the one hand, we need our derivatives to be uh, our derivative to be um, negative, such that it allows for one function to decrease, and on the other hand, it needs to be positive, such that it allows for the other function to increase. Right. So if you only focus on one-dimensional first-order uh, differential uh, differential equations here, we we won't be able to fit this function. Luckily, um, we can sort of uh, provide our system with additional freedom and uh, introduce some fictitious dimensions, right? So if I imagine that uh, this data doesn't lie on the plane anymore, but lies in like 2D space, I should be able to find, you know, um, paths in, the, in that 2D space that, that lead me from one point to the other uh, that do not intersect one another, right? And I don't have that um, problem anymore. So uh, that idea is uh, explored in the augmented neural ODS paper. And in general, um, like if you're to use neural ODS, it's recommended that you use uh, augmented neural ODS uh, instead. So uh, that's a point that I want to make in the hour, just in case you 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 run off uh, with with wanting to to run these. Cool. All right. So. Let's talk about one more application area before we start wrapping up. And that is normalizing flows. So the topic of density estimation is uh, wanting to get a good approximation of some probability density distribution of some variable. This can be quite complicated. For example, people sometimes talk about the probability density of images in the image space. That's very, very difficult to capture. We, we, we don't know how to express it in, in simple functions. So um, one way we could try to approach this problem is by instead starting with some very well-known distribution, such as a standard normal Gaussian distribution, which we know how to draw from, like we can evaluate uh, like the probability of something being in a certain area. It's quite a nice uh, function to work with. Uh, in general, and we can think about um, what happens when you transform uh, uh, the random variable with uh, a random variable with that distribution with some deterministic transformation. Right? And we can also say that the, this transformation will be learnable. It has some parameters theta. So we have uh, a rule that tells us how the probability density of this new variable depends on the probability density of the of the previous variable, right? And it, it's, it's just this formula here. Um, you don't need to think about it just, uh, too much, but it's this term here that actually causes trouble to us. So uh, J is a Jacobian, and Jacobians are like in this case a matrix of uh, size d by d, where d is the dimensionality of of this z. So wanting to find the determinant of this Jacobian uh, actually requires uh, requires cubic time. And if we have if we have something like an image, as I said before, they can be you know like tens of thousands. So it's really restrictive to uh, require that we find the determinant of a ten thousand by ten thousand matrix. So normalizing flows um, uh, sort of try to circumvent this issue uh, by restricting uh, this determinant. Uh, in particular, I think they make it lower triangular. And then you can find the determinant 
very uh, fairly quickly, but then that really restricts what uh, this transformation can be, right? So we, we, we can't really think about like very general transformations anymore. And uh, sort of um, empirically, they have found some, uh, some transformations that re repeatedly applied uh, sort of are able to approximate a lot of densities uh, we are interested in uh, quite well, but it feels a bit unsat unsatisfactory to restrict um, what these functions can be too much. Um, luckily for us, uh, if we, uh, sorry, I should have said that uh, you, you apply this iteratively, right? Like, so if Z0 is a normal variable, then uh, Z1 is probably not gonna be too far from a normal variable, but I can then define Z2 with this uh, relation again, and I can do, uh, keep doing this over and over again. Uh, now we could, like, we see this, you know, discrete series of uh, transformations and think, well, can we turn them continuous somehow? And then, yeah, it turns out actually we can turn them continuous. We can talk about, you know, Z0 at, uh, Z at time zero and Z at times one and try to sort of fit the dynamics uh, of uh, this process. And the really nice thing that turns out is that the this determinant here in the continuous uh, case transforms into a trace. A trace is just the sum of the diagonal elements of this uh, Jacobian. And then rather than needing to uh, do a operation that's cubic in the dim dimensionality, we get something that's uh, linear in the uh, dimensionality. Uh, I think because of some caveats, this turns out to be um, quadratic in the dimensionality in the original paper, but then there's a follow-up paper that makes it linear. Um, cool. So because we don't have too much time, I'll probably leave the details of exactly how that's implemented uh, for you to sort of explore on your own uh, in the notebook and just uh, talk about the results. So let me just, uh, actually, are there any conceptual uh, questions before I talk about the results? About like this setup? Doesn't seem to be the case. Cool. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the results. So yeah, so I'll, I'll reshare again. Uh, here. Cool. All right. So let's say that this is our target distribution here, right? It's uh, a fairly difficult distribution to sort of describe mathematically, well, it's not too difficult to describe mathematically, but it's definitely not really straightforward to, to reason about. Right? So we can perform the fitting process that uh, I described, and then we can look at how uh, our probability distribution changes with uh, time, right? So like this would be the equivalent of how it changes um, at each layer of, of, of this, uh, uh, of this transformation, right? Uh, if, if it were discrete, we, we could do this finitely many times. Obviously, we here we do it for, at every uh, like time delta. Cool. So we start with the standard normal distribution over here. You have samples here. You have the log probability of of the distribution that we have fitted here. Right. So um, as we uh, as we sort of like propagate through through this normalizing flow, our probability uh, distribution starts to change and you can start to see how uh, our probability mass sort of gets separated into, into different uh, clusters that end up forming the rings that we have in our uh, actual distribution. And uh, at time like T, the final time, which in this case is uh, 10, we end up with a probability distribution that re matches really well what we've observed in terms of samples uh, from our target distribution. 
So uh, again, again, I guess uh, in case that is confusing, uh, we are once we fitted our model. This is this is how we can sort of uh, query partial transformations of uh, our original Gaussian uh, distribution into um, a target uh, target distribution in, in this uh, in case this thing. Um, something that's quite interesting to explore further and a paper goes into this is how does this relate to uh, images for example right like a partially transformed uh, transformed image does it contain some useful information um, yeah cool all right so that's this and then finally I'm going to talk about Finally, I'm going to talk about uh, like notes and further steps. So I already covered um, why uh, augmented neural ODs are a good idea. Um, there is quite a cool paper that extends this paper on, uh, on first order ODs into higher order ODs, in, in particular second order uh, ODs. Uh, which is really cool for uh, physical applications. So we know that a lot of physical laws follow um, dynamics that can be expressed in terms of uh, second order uh, differential equations. And this would allow us to fit the parameters of, of uh, those equations from, from data. There is the sort of making the density estimation faster paper which is called uh, fjord uh, which is if you if you're interested in exploring this density uh, estimation part you should definitely go for that one rather than this vanilla uh, nn and finally uh, there's quite a cool uh, recent development uh, in that the authors of this paper also started exploring uh, stochastic uh, versions of, of of the ordinary differential equations which is when um, our uh, function is allowed to sort of uh, jitter with noise at each new point, right? So like, if you, if you imagine, Im imagine it to be a discrete sequence, you would introduce noise at each step, but because this is a, con a continuous uh, sequence, it's sort of like this uh, random process that, that jitters and, and goes through time. Um, cool, All right. So we have 10 remaining min minutes. Uh, can people let me know what they would mostly be interested to uh, go into from from the from the notebook? I think it'd be great if you can go deeper into the log um, estimation that the part that you did right before yeah. uh, so the density estimation yeah density estimation yeah yeah and normalizing cool. flow right. yeah yeah so all right let's see uh would you like to look at the code or the sort of theory behind this probably more more theory behind it Cool. All right. So then that's uh, it's 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 expanded better than I'll be able to do uh, in the remaining time in the original uh, normalizing flows paper. Uh, but sort of uh, conceptually, uh, maybe if I why have I not linked the original paper? Um, let's see. So uh, is, is it clear sort of this, uh, how this transformation allows us to start from one density and end up in a different density that may be slightly more complicated? Uh, and then how I can take this new density and apply this again to get a third density that's even further away from the original density, right? So if I've, oh, some questions. 
Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to this question in a second. Um, so if I've learned the parameters already of, of this trans these transformations are, then going from the original variable into, into uh, uh, going from the original density into the final density, just a repeated uh, application of this rule over here. And as long as I can compute each term in this, this rule, I don't have an issue. Now, fitting the parameters of this, um, is slightly more complicated. Um, it's done through variational inference, which I don't have time to cover uh, in detail here. So I'll, I'll just have to defer uh, to, to the paper there. Sorry, that's a bit unsatisfactory as an answer, but I, I, don't, I don't think I'll be able to. No, no, no it's fine. Uh, I definitely me... have to go through the notebook, yeah. Uh, let me uh, look at Jamie's question. I've heard neural ODs are also significantly more memory efficient than some other types of models as they don't need to store all the parameters during the backprop. Why, how is this the case? So that's a really interesting uh, question. So it's a bit of a misconception. So the original authors of the paper sort of make that claim in the paper without really backing it up. Um, in a sense, it can sometimes be more uh, memory efficient for me to, to just fit a smaller neural network on the dynamics of uh, the, the, the data that I have here. Then it would be to fit like a very over parameterized model on the actual data, right? But that's definitely not true in general because a lot of data sequences don't have very good dynamics, right? I would probably require uh, something with a lot of parameters to capture anything close to the actual dynamics of things. Now, uh, what the advancement that this paper makes as compared to a naive approach of how I could do this is um, in defining this uh, adjoint state, this error signal equivalent that allows us to do this backprop uh, through like the, the time slices of the neural network. So um, sort of this idea has been around for a while, but it's been very, very costly to backdrop, uh, back prop through uh, the OD solvers like this thing, right? So something I, I could have done instead of defining this adjoint is try to just use autograd, uh, like automatic differentiation to back prop how these transformations uh, you know, are like the, the parameters of these transformations are affected, uh, are affecting the, the, the loss rather. All right, so, so that's quite computationally more expensive. Um, now there's one more claim that's made about sort of the memory efficiency runtime thing is that this requires a lot uh, fewer evaluations. And that's also comes with, with a bit of a, Caveat, uh, caveat that um, you, at the end of the day, you still need to update each of your parameters in uh, your um, in your neural network, right? Like th there's no getting away from that. I can't get like something that's sublinear in the number of parameters uh, in um, in my network, um, and What's more, I will need to do this for every uh, sample in, in my batch, right? Like that, that's also something that I can't really avoid. So I think the comparisons that are made in, being made there are mainly in regards to uh, this backprop through, uh, through the ODA solver needing to do, like to update each parameter, parameter multiple times. Um, so uh, this reminds me to your other question of, is this starting the computational graph? Uh, did I manage to answer your question there? Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so are there, is there any final question? We have three minutes left. Doesn't seem so, all right. Cool, so I will stop the recording now then.